I want to begin by introducing us to this issue of the human condition. Um, I might actually put up this drawing. I've just scribbled this little drawing, and it, it shows an elephant. This is proverbial elephant in the living room. We, we talk about the elephant in the living room referring to something that nobody is acknowledging, but it's a massive issue. Well, well, this is the elephant of elephants uh, in our living room. In fact, you can see the elephant is absolutely jamming the whole room full, so there's hardly any space left. And, and so we're living with this subject, this issue that's the, the most fundamental and serious issue about being a human that has been so difficult to deal with that we, we, um, we, we've learned to have to just block it out so we, we don't acknowledge it. So we sort of say, hi, Sarah, pass us the, the, the salt and, and how are you going with, the, uh, with your new um, team at, at soccer and, you know, let's sell those shares and, and fax my secretary and all this stuff, all this dialogue and around the side of the room like that with this elephant in just jamming us against the wall. I mean, that's how amazing this situation that the human race has lived in. There's this massive issue, this elephant in our living room, now, that issue is the issue of the human condition. Okay, so, so what is the human condition and, and why have we been living in such fear of it that we can't hardly recognise that it even exists anymore? And yet it's the underlying issue in, kind of, in all of uh, human, human life. The, the human condition is the issue of good and evil in human makeup. The issue of why aren't we humans ideally behaved? I mean... Since the, the universally accepted ideals are to be cooperative, loving and selfless, why the hell are we competitive, aggressive and selfish? I mean, the complete opposite. In fact, so ruthlessly uh, competitive and, and selfish and, and, and brutal uh, that life's become all but unbearable. We've nearly destroyed our own planet. I mean, why do we, thinking, uh, reasoning, rational, uh, immensely clever, supposedly... Um, sensible beings behave so badly and cause so much suffering and devastation. There's this writer, Blaise uh, Pascal, spelled out the sort of the full horror of our sort of contradictory nature when he, when he wrote, what a contradiction is man, what a novelty. Uh, novelty because we have this amazing conscious mind. Yet what a monster, what a chaos, what a prodigy capable of being a judge of all things. Yet an yet an imbecile worm of the earth, a repository of truth, yet a sewer of uncertainty and error. Humans are the glory and the scum of the universe. William Shakespeare, in his play Hamlet, makes a similar observation. What a piece of work is man, how noble of reason, how infinite in faculty, in action how like an angel, in apprehension like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights me not. Yeah, I mean, half of the human head is this giant association cortex, this reasoning. Um, we have this incredible brain that can think and reason. Most brilliantly clever of creatures, the ones who, who is those, those uh, Pascal and, and Shakespeare said, a godlike in our infinite faculty of reason and apprehension, a glorious angel-like prodigy, capable of being judge of all things and a repository of truth, yet also the meanest, most vicious, most capable of inflicting pain, cruelty, suffering and degradation, the species that, that behave so appalling that we seem to be monsters, imbeciles, a sewer of uncertainty and error, and chaos, the essence of dust, the scum of the universe. So there's this huge paradox about being a human, this, this huge issue. How could we humans possibly be considered good, you know, um, when, when all the evidence seemed unequivocally um, to indicate that we are flawed, uh, bad, even, even evil species? What is it that, uh, I mean... That's what this issue of the human condition is. Are we some sort of evolutionary mistake, a cancer in the universe, or could we possibly be divine beings? I mean, this issue of our contradictory nature, this question of questions, is such a fearful question that the more we thought about it, the more depressed our thinking became. So humans learn to block out that issue, to... to uh, 
to um, to 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 avoid thinking about it as it's being. I mean, the famous uh, psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst Carl Jung said, um, "When our shadow, which is his term for this darker side of our nature, appears, it is quite within the bounds of possibility that for a man to recognise the relative evil of his nature." But it is a rare and shattering experience for him to gaze into the face of absolute evil. So yes, this the face of absolute evil is a shattering possibility if we humans allow our minds to think about it that we might indeed be a terrible mistake. So there's this huge dilemma about being a human that the, that if, without understanding we've had no choice but to 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 block out of our mind to in fact resign ourselves to, 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 to not asking the, uh, addressing that question until such times we could find an answer to it. Now, that all might sound extraordinary, but um, all humans growing up start thinking about the imperfection of human existence. They start wrestling with this issue of the human condition from about 12 onwards, and they get deeper because somehow... For some reason, they don't understand. Adults don't seem to be wanting to talk about this, this huge elephant, this, this horrific issue of why aren't humans uh, ideally behaved? Why are we the way we are? And um, so they just sort of wrestle with this, this issue and, they, and, the, th and the, the thinking goes deeper and deeper until around 13 or 14 years of age, they... they the issue of the imperfection of the world around them starts to develop into the issue of why aren't they uh, ideally behaved? They start to discover uh, aspects of anger and egocentricity and indifferences and to others and so forth. So the the human condition without of it becomes the human condition within. And it, and when they get to this point where they start to encounter the human condition in within. And this, this this deeper quest to try to make sense of human life reaches that level. That's when they, they they become suicidally depressed, trying to face that down without an understanding of it. And so they they have to at that moment resign themselves to never looking at that question. So so um, humans from about twelve to fifteen, and and, it, and in schooling, you know, teachers and parents know the kids are unreachable. They're they're sort of they're in their room. They're playing loud music. They're, um, they're, they're, they they snap when you talk to them. They 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 they're unreachable. And and but and, and we kind of blame it. We say it's all oh, it's puberty blues. Or but it's not. It's not. Uh, it's the clues in the word blues. Blues means depression. It's not due to pu puberty to the, the hormones. That, I mean. At 13 or 14, kids are going into um, sexual maturity and sure, and but that's the most healthy time in their life. So for them to sort of be seriously depressed to the point that they get glandular fever, a lot of typically people during during resignation get glandular fever. And so there's a much more serious, it's a psychological battle they're engaged with, even though adults, because they can't deal with the issue of the human condition, have just come up with this excuse that, oh, that, oh that, that's just going through puberty. The hormones are swinging around. Um, but we've been living with hormone uh, puberty since we were microbes, I mean, since sexual reproduction. Uh, and so we've hugely ad adapted to that. But what, what we haven't become adapted to is the horror of the imperfections of human life and try to understand it. We're a thinking, understanding being, so we want to try to make sense of that. So we, children actually do start look, thinking and, and looking at the human condition and, and, and it gets deeper and deeper. And so, but adults, as I said, they're already resigned. They don't want to go near that subject. I mean, only two days after people are resigned, you can hardly get them to remember to go back near that corner. It's such a fearfully depressing issue, this issue of the human condition, if you try to stay and face it down. I mean, so this, I might just read, you, you'll read about it in, uh, in Chapter 2 in the book, but um, it, it's the fastest way I, I know of to evidence just how fearful the subject of the human condition really has been, how, 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 big it, how serious is this elephant that we can't look at. And um, so this is a, a rare description of an adult talking to, uh, a psychiatrist, talking to a, a, an adolescent going through resignation 
and it's very revealing of um, the truth of what the adolescents are really wrestling with. And he, and well, I'll just read you what this is from uh, the Pulitzer Prize, American Pulitzer Prize winning child psychiatrist Robert Coles, and he said, "I tell of the loneliness many young people feel. It's a loneliness that has to do with a self-imposed judgment of sorts." I remember a young man of 15 who engaged in light banter only to shut down, shake his head, refuse to talk at all when his own life and troubles became the subject at hand. He had stopped going to school. He sat in his room for hours listening to rock music. The door closed. I asked him about his head-shaking behaviour. I wondered whom he was addressing. He replied, no one. I hesitated, gulped a bit and took a chance. Not yourself. I... Um, <clears throat> He looked right at me now in a sustained stare for the first time. Why do you say that, he asked. I declared, decided not to answer the, the question in the manner in which I was trained. He's basically trained to avoid the human condition, being a resigned adult. Instead, with some unease, I heard myself saying this, I've been there. I remember being there. Remember when I felt I couldn't say a word to anyone. The young man kept staring at me, didn't speak. When he took out his handkerchief and wiped his eyes, I realised they'd begun to fill. Yeah, the, the boy was in tears because Cole, Coles had reached him with, with some recognition and appreciation of what he was wrestling with. Uh, Coles had shown some honesty about what the boy could see and was struggling with, namely the horror of the utter hypocrisy of human life, including his own life. Um, so so here's, a, here's an adolescent in the midst of resignation, he hasn't given up trying to make sense of the human condition. This amazing riddle of why humans are so uh, divisively behave when the ideals are ideally obviously to be the complete opposite. And no one's talking about it, everyone's just saying, because once you resign, then you're on a mission to escape that dark corner and that dark, dark issue. You're on a bender to as a self-distraction, you want uh, so adults just tell jokes all day and talk about the weather and and just keep bubbling, keep 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 keeping away from that that de de dreadful issue. And and as you'll see in chapter um, two of my book, you, it describes how to make sense of human behaviour. You, you all you have to do is factor in the fact that they're resigned and living in denial of the human condition, and, and all their behaviour is being driven by that denial at fear of this, this, this elephant, this issue of the human condition. So yes, the human condition has been a, 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 a horrific subject, uh, an un, un, unconfrontable subject, while we couldn't explain it. Um, I've heard it described as the personal unspeakable and the, and the black box inside of humans that they can't go near. Um, so that's why this issue has been the great elephant in our living room, uh, the all-important issue, but the one issue we could could hardly admit existed, let alone think about. Now, um, just to pr supply some evidence of of um, of how how pervasive this denial of this horrific subject of the human condition is, the the greatest philosopher of all time is generally considered to be Plato. I mean, philosophy is the study of truths underlying reality, or reality. I mean, um, Alfred North Whitehead, who was considered one of the greatest uh, um, philosophers of the, of the 20th century, said about Plato, you know, um, all of philosophy is but a footnote to Plato. So, Whatever Plato had to say was obviously incredibly profound. So he's the greatest philosopher, the study of all the truths underlying reality. So what was it that Plato said that was, um, since he's the greatest philosopher, what was the central um, idea or concept that he had to, to communicate to us all? Well, Plato's... Our most highly regarded work is called the the Republic dialogue of the Republic, and and the centre of the Republic. So this is is this analogy or allegory of a cave of humans living in a cave, hiding from the issue of the human condition. So this is the greatest philosopher of all time, philosopher being the study of truths underlying reality, and he's saying. 
what I have to tell you is the most dominating feature about human existence is that they that they are so afraid of this issue of the human condition that they are living deep underground in a cave, so they don't have to face this issue. They create a whole world inside this cave of blockout. And uh, so I'll just read you what Plato actually said. So this was written uh, 300 years before Christ or something. It's, but it's so profound, he's still the greatest philosopher. So he said, um, this is uh, what Plato wrote. Um, I want you to go and picture the enlightenment or ignorance of our human conditions somewhat as follows. This is what Plato actually wrote. Imagine an underground chamber like a cave with an entrance open to the daylight and running a long way underground. In this chamber are men who have been prisoners there. Now, Plato went on to describe how the cave exit is, is blocked by a fire, which he said corresponds to the, to the sun, which the cave prisoners have, have had to hide from because it's searing, painful, he said, light would make visible, he said the unbearable depressing issue of the imperfections of human life. So he said, I'm going to tell you about the human condition. And he said, they're living in this cave of deep underground, hiding from the the, the fire and, and, and its representation, with uh, the sun and its representation of the fire, because if it's se searing, painful light, it would make visible the unbearably depressing issue of the imperfections of human life. So, so... That's how serious and terrifying an issue the human condition has been, that we're living, according to this great philosopher, greatest of philosophers, deep underground. I know that um, in the, well, it makes sense, in the absence of understanding um, of the human condition, we need to come up with some excuse uh, for why we are the way we are in order to cope with the, sort of the negative implications of being divisively instead of cooperatively and lovingly behaved. And so we've obviously done that. Now, what, what we do, we came up with the excuse that our behaviour is no different uh, from that seen in the animal kingdom, kingdom, that we humans are competitive, aggressive and selfish because of our animal heritage. I mean, we argued that um, uh, we are the victims of, of savage animal instincts in us that, that compel us to fight and, and compete for food, shelter, territory and a mate. That, um, that we have the mercy of a biological need to reproduce our genes. And that, that That's why we're being so competitive and aggressive and not cooperative and loving. But, of course, uh, this reason that biologists uh, today have, have been putting forward, it, it can't be the real cause of our competitive and divisive behaviour because descriptions of human behaviour such as um, egocentric and arrogant and inspired and depressed, deluded, pessimistic, and optimistic, artificial, hateful, mean, immoral, guilt-ridden, evil, psychotic, neurotic, uh, you know, all recognise the involvement in our species of a unique, fully conscious thinking mind, that we are a psycho uh, that there's a psychological dimension to our behaviour. Humans have suffered not from a genetic opportunism-based non-psychological animal condition, but the conscious mind-based psychologically troubled human condition. Um, of course, um, the other obvious reason that the old animals are, are competitive and aggressive, and that's why we are defence simply doesn't hold water, is that um, we humans have, have cooperative, loving, moral instincts. Not, not competitive, aggressive instincts, but cooperative, loving, moral instincts. I mean, the expression of which is, or voice of which within us is, is what we call our conscience. I mean, the, the reason um, adolescents uh, become so depressed during resignation and why they don't fall for and adopt the savage instincts excuse, at least not while they're going in the midst of it, later on they grab it with glee, but um, they don't adopt it while they're in it. They don't buy it is because their moral instinct, if self or soul, makes them aware that they, um, that they ideally should be cooperatively and loving. I mean, the, the fundamental reason um, humans have a sense of guilt is because we have, we have a moral conscience. As I fully explained in, in Freedom, our species' instinctive heritage is one of being cooperative and loving, not of being competitive and aggressive. So... Yeah, in truth, we do all know that, that the old animals are competitive and aggressive and that's why we are. 
the fence doesn't hold water. It, it doesn't explain our psychologically distressed, guilt-ridden human condition. So that's where the human race is, is basically, uh, and biology, it, it has been stalled, waiting for an waiting in an increasingly distressed state for the real explanation of our psychologically troubled, guilt-ridden human condition that will finally make sense of, of, of the dilemma of human life, bring understanding and peace to the, to the human mind at the most profound, fundamental, deep, fully accountable, truthful level. Um, so we need the psychosis addressing and solving a real explanation of the human condition. Those excuses, that the excuse that, that we're competitive and aggressive because of our animal heritage, uh, obviously helped us uh, get by while we waited for the real explanation. But it's reached a point where we need the, the, the one that really deals with and explains the psychological dilemma of the human condition. And through doing that, bringing relieving understanding to the psychosis in humans, finally alleviates that psychosis and brings about the transformation of the human race. Through, through understanding, through, through to this dignifying understanding of, of the dark side of ourselves, to our shadow, as Jung called it, makes sense of that. So no longer does it tr distress and trouble us. Trouble us. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this is a, another Michael Looney cartoon, uh, Australian cartoonist. Uh, he, he's, or, he's got quite a few cartoons in Freedom. And this is another deadly honest one by... Um, by Michael, and it shows um, this great tangle. I mean, that's trying to make sense of human life up to the present. It's just been impossible. It's just one gigantic mystery. How do you make sense of this this confusion? People talk to each other. They're not making any, not getting deeper into it. They're not unraveling the, the tangle of what it is to be a human. So it's all just a big confusing mess. And uh, so that's where we end up. Until we find understanding of the human condition, we end in this. This, this total mess of confusion and bewilderment about why we are the way we are. Ultimately, the ultimate knowledge we needed was to understand the human condition. When we can finally make sense of that, the whole tangle will unravel. So that's a very power, powerful metaphor of, um, of um, our, our state of ignorance, of not being able to understand ourselves, make sense of the dark side of ourselves truthfully, Understand the psychosis within us, where that, where all the pain and suffering and frustration is coming from. Okay, so that's how important explanation of the of the of the um, of the psychologically distressed, guilt-ridden human condition is. It's the only thing that can really alleviate the suffering in the world, the dignifying understanding of, of that. So now um, I want to present. The explanation that I'm saying is fully accountable and therefore true that is presented in, in this book. It, it, there's a summary of it, a brief summary of it in Chapter 1, and it's explained more fully in Chapter 3. Um, to do that, I'll, I'll use this, this simple, little simple analogy. So I'll very quickly explain this riddle of, I mean, if you think about the, honestly about the human situation, the, the explanation is not that that hard to find because what is unique about humans? They're fully conscious. And um, if you think more about that, I mean, we must have had it before we became fully conscious species, we must have been controlled by, by, an instinct, by our instincts that are acquired through natural selection, as other animals are. And obviously, when we became conscious, the conscious mind can make sense of experience, understand cause and effect. We've got much developed, we've got memory, which is a sort of, animals develop memory, the capacity for memory through trying to, um, nerves have this power to, uh, uh, they're developed to, to um, coordinate movement in animals. But they leave a sort of, uh, when messages pass through nerves, leave a, a, an image, an after image, which represents memory, much developed. If you can remember past events, you can compare them with current events. You can deduce commonly occurring events. And on the basis of what's commonly occurred in the past, you can start to make predictions about what likely occurred in the future. And that can provide further feedback to refine your insights further and further. Now, if it's sufficiently developed, this ability to understand makes sense of experience of cause and effect, 
you can you can understand you can be, you can reason how experiences are related you can become conscious understanding and so presumably this huge association cortex associate information makes sense of experience um, in us became sufficiently developed for us to become conscious fully conscious and at that point it makes sense that we would have been able to take control from from our instincts the management of our life because now we can understand um, how the world does things we can we can reason ourselves how to do things and so we can at a certain point when we became conscious we must have challenged our inst our original instinctive orientations for the management of our lives and if we think about that it makes sense that there must have been a clash between these two aspects of ourselves our gene-based instinctive learning system or orientating system and our newer conscious mind that could understand the world so now I want to try to create and, and explain the human condition and all aspects of human life, in fact, with a very simple analogy. We want to see what would happen were you to put a fully conscious mind on the head of an animal that was or that's already instinctively controlled. So let's grab a, a stork, a, a big bird, because and, and we put we want him to carry this big brain. So we we graft onto the head of this stork um, this um, this fully conscious mind. And we'll call him Adam Stork because this has a similar uh, similarities to the story of the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve take the fruit from the tree of knowledge, they become conscious and start searching for understanding. But in that story, they're banished as bad and evil. But this story has a different outcome. So, I, so we've got this Stork, Adam Stork here, and we put on this big brain on his head, and here he is here. And now Storks, they uh, breed during uh, the summertime in the, on the rooftops in Europe. And then when that gets cold, they migrate down the coast of Africa to the swamps of South Africa and they back and forth every year. Now they learn that's not an understanding of where they should fly. It's an orientation they acquired through natural selection. Obviously, all the storks with a genetic makeup that inclined them to fly across the Sahara got frizzled. So now through natural selection, all the storks know to fly around the they don't understand, but they're orientated to fly around the coast of Africa. So they have that perfect instinctive orientation where to fly and where not to fly. And they acquired that through natural selection. But, but they, of course, they don't understand why they should fly and not fly there. So what would happen were we to graft a fully conscious mind, such as humans have, on the head of one of these stalks? And we're sitting behind in a light, ultralight, let's imagine. We want to see what happens. So this stalk, Adam Stork, we call him, flying, flapping along with the other storks, perfectly instinctively oriented, and he starts thinking for himself. He says, oh, I can see an island down here with some apple trees. Uh, apple trees. I think I'll fly down here and have a rest or get some apples. So he heads off, of course, to carry out his first grand experiment in self-adjustment. But what's going to happen? His instinctive self, which doesn't flight path, doesn't go down to the island, is going to try to pull him back onto the flight path. So we, this is, represents his instinctive self and the, and the other storks who haven't got a fully conscious mind yet. They all want him to fly, stay on this course. You should stay on course here, Adam. You're flying off course. Now, Adam's got two choices. He can fly back on course and he'll feel his instincts will be happy and, and, and not criticising, but he's got a conscious mind. He has to search for knowledge. He can't cut his brain out and throw it away. So after a while, he realises he has to persevere with his search for knowledge because it's only by carrying out these experiments in self-adjustment that he'll find out what are the, the right and the wrong um, uh, understandings. So he decides, I, have to, I can't explain it, but I have to do what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to persevere with his experiments. So there's another island. He wants to go and have a rest, so he carries out another experiment in self-adjustment. And again, the instincts criticise him for flying off course. This is this red thing here. This criticism. Now, Adam does. He can't sit down with his instinctive self and say, just hold it right here before everything goes off the rails. If he could, he could have a little, if he could do this, it'd be fantastic. He could have said, now listen to his instinctive self. You are perfectly orientated. You know where to fly and you don't know where not to fly, but you don't understand that. I'm an understanding system. I need to understand why I should fly that way and not this way. So by all means, criticise me. Tell me, sorry, not criticise. Tell me when I'm off course, but don't criticise me for carrying out these experiments in self-adjustment. But that, and then this 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 war that began here, this war wouldn't have occurred because 
the instinctive self would say, ah, now I understand why you, you, you carry out these experiments in effect. But obviously he's in a catch-22. He's got no knowledge at this point. He can't defend his, what he's doing. He can't explain himself. So three things happened. And they're the only things he could do, unable to explain himself. He tried to block out the criticism. I don't want to listen to it. Look, I'm not bad. I don't, can't explain why I'm not bad, but I'm not. And he got angry towards the criticism. He said, listen, mate, I'm not bad for flying it, whatever I'm doing. I have to do it, but I can't explain why I have to do it. And then he became egocentric. Ego, if you look it up in the dictionary, means conscious thinking self. It's just another word for the intellect. So the ego or conscious thinking became centered, egocentric or focused on trying to validate himself, needing a win out of every situation he can, some relief, some reinforcement to, to relieve himself of the criticism he's having to live with. So old Adam Storks become um, angry, egocentric and alienated. And these three aspects, which the seven deadly sins can be rounded up on, out of anger, egocentricity, and alienation, he becomes a sufferer of the human condition, angry, egocentric, and alienated. But now let's just look at that picture. In that little story, who is the hero of the story? Surely it's Adam, because he had to have the, the courage to suffer, flying off course and searching for knowledge, despite his inability to explain why he had to fly off course. In the man of La Mancha, he had to uh, march into hell, be prepared to march into hell for a heavenly cause. We had to lose ourselves to find ourselves. We had to suffer becoming upset in order to find the knowledge because one day he finds sufficient knowledge that he can find it. And I'm suggesting that that's what's presented in this book after two million years because some two million years that we've been fully conscious. We've finally found sufficient knowledge, science has in particular, to make it possible to explain this. Because this whole explanation is based on un being able to explain the difference between the gene-based learning system, which is can give species orientations, and the nerve-based learning system, which can give species understandings. Now, until... Because the story in the Garden of Eden has got the, got the essence there. It says that we... We took the fruit from the tree of knowledge. We became conscious. But on that story, it says, and Adam and Eve became sufferers of sin and were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. But this story says, no, no, they got it wrong. They're the, Adam is actually the hero of the whole story, Adam and Eve, of the, of the whole story of life on earth. Because surely the conscious mind is nature's greatest invention. And to be given this task of, searching for understanding when the whole world's condemning you because all the other innocent stalks are condemning his search for knowledge, all of nature, the sun coming up, the rain, the clouds, they're all, of, the, na the natural world is by association, associated with our original instinctive self, so the whole world in effect's ganged up on us. And yet all the time this guy is good and not bad but he can't explain why. I mean imagine living in a little village where you couldn't explain, you had to plant, I don't know, thistles and and but you couldn't explain why you had to do it. Now, the whole village, everyone's agreed, you don't plant weeds, you know. Now, you've got to do this, but you can't explain why. I mean, after just one day, I mean, they're going to be putting dead cats in your letterbox and they won't talk to you when you go down to the, the shops. Imagine two million years of living on this planet un, undefended, unjustly condemned. And it could end. The story of we became conscious and thrown out we couldn't liberate ourselves. So that until science, which means knowledge, found these the key in, m understandings that make explanation of the human condition possible, which is that the gene-based learning system can only orientate a species where the conscious mind needs to understand. It, the nerve-based learning system needs to understand the world. Could we finally relieve ourselves of the human condition? So that's what science, science, as I said, literally means knowledge. Science um, literally means knowledge. Scientia, knowledge. And the knowledge that we ultimately needed was knowledge, understanding of the human condition, why we're good and not bad after all. And then and only then could this great burden of guilt be lifted off the shoulders of the human race and finally everyone could relax and understand themselves and look into this dark corner with, without recrimination.
So this is a massive breakthrough. For two million years, I'm suggesting, we because it wasn't Adam Stork, it was obviously us conscious humans that became fully conscious and suffered this horrific split between our instinctive self or soul and our newer conscious self. This, this story you'll see gets even more complicated and, and much because our instinctive self wasn't to some flight path but to actually behaving in a cooperative, loving way. As I said earlier, we have a moral conscience that wants us to behave and that, that was achieved. How we acquired an unconditionally selfless, altruistic moral conscience is one of the great mysteries of biology, but it, you'll see it, it's another one of these stories these explanations that we couldn't access until we could explain the human condition. Suddenly when you explain the human condition, all the caves speak, all the stuff that we used to go on about in the cave, which is all dishonest denial, such as we have savage animal instincts, can be dispensed with. And we can get out in the sun and talk about the truth at last. So, so humans acquired an unconditionally selfless, moral, instinctive self. And, and that was actually achieved through nurturing, which again is an uncondemning truth because no child has been adequately nurtured while this horrific battle has been going on. Until we could explain that, it was an unbearable truth to have to admit that nurturing is what made us human. But anyway, um, so um, we, couldn't, we couldn't defend ourselves, but now we can, and, and the human condition can subside because through through this, and we can, as it were, move out of Plato's cave of dishonest denial, come out from underground and, and, and live in the warm, healing sunshine of understanding. Um, and, and so that's um, 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 a, a quick snapshot. Uh, and it's really an obvious explanation that we became conscious and then we're at war with our instincts. And the result of that battle was a psychosis. Psych means soul from the Greek and it, and osis means sickness or illness, so we're psycho psychotic and 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 neurotic neuron cell uh, neuron nerves. Neuro the mind becomes preoccupied with denials, and we became psychotic and neurotic. So this is an explanation of the psychological state of humans, and it's only finding the psychological explanation that relieves the psychosis. So this finally heals the human race at the deepest fundamental level. It brings understanding to the dark side of ourselves. Um, it, so science is, is the liberator, if you like, or Messiah, you know, the, the liberator of humanity because science makes it possible at last to explain that we're good and not bad after all because it can explain, it's found the, the double helix, it's found the understanding of how the, how the gene-based learning system works, how to natural, the, the principles behind natural selection and understand about nerves and how they can develop memory and once you've got memory you can compare experiences and, and so on, you become conscious. So it's the ability now to explain the difference between the nerve-based and gene-based learning system or information processing systems that finally allows us to ameliorate or bring peace to our psychologically troubled human condition. So that's essentially what, what my book presents. Um, now, um, I just might quickly try to explain this cover. So obviously it's got a great big sun here and um, it's got freedom. And so freedom is the ultimate war cry of humanity when it finally breaks through into the, into the clear and, and finds the relieving understanding of ourselves. And, and the sun has always been the image of, of, of knowledge, um, um, understanding. So the sun coming up has been the historic symbol of of um, humans having finally broken through and relieved themselves of the human condition. And the word, the one word you'd say when you do that is freedom. And to, to explain what you mean, you, you're now free, you're bringing an end to the human condition at last. So freedom, the end of the human condition, um, at last, the redeeming, reconciling and rehabilitating biological explanation of the human condition that brings about the dreamed of dawn of understanding, the sun coming up, and ends all the suffering and conflict on earth. So you've got these people jumping for joy down the bottom. Um, I might just um, uh, play some, um, some music from, uh, there's lots of, the imagery of the sun and, and that representing freedom, uh, finding knowledge, understanding of ourselves, has been with us since time immemorial. And, and um, so I might just play these, just play this, uh, this is Jim Morrison from The Doors. Listen to the words, for the, uh, just some of the words of this. At first flash of Eden, we race down to the
Okay, so you can see the key words in there, freedom, waiting that race down to freedom shore, waiting for the sun, understanding, to tell us what went wrong. Why, why did we become sufferers of, of the human condition? You might wonder why Jim Morrison and the Doors call themselves the, the Doors. It comes from William Blake's poem, The Marriage of he heaven, and her, uh, heaven and Hell. And you can see in that, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, that William Blake's talking about the marriage of heaven, the marriage of the good and the bad in us, the, finally the ability to, to explain the human condition, reconcile the polar opposites in our makeup. So in this poem, Marriage of Hell, Heaven and Earth, he says, when the doors of perception are cleansed, man will see things as they truly are, for man has closed himself up till he sees things, all things through narrow chinks in his cavern. So, I mean, he's, everyone goes to this metaphor of the cave, this cavern we've had to hide in. And he says, so one day when we when we can, uh, if you bring up Adam Stork again, one day when we can reconcile this upset state of ours, anger, egocentricity with our innocent state and, 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 and heal our divided condition, our split nature, um, we will no longer be preoccupied with denial and, and, and anger and egocentricity and suddenly we'll be able to see the world as it really is because those things preoccupied us. They, they, every minute of every day we were trying to get a win, trying to get a relief. We were uh, positioning ourselves, trying to make ourselves a success and get some relief from the insecurity caused by our not being able to understand why we're good and not bad. So when the doors of perception are cleansed, man will see things. So when we can clean make sense of us, we'll we see things as they truly are. And that's what happens when you find this understanding and you digest it. It'll, it'll bring you back to life. I mean, um, um, what's that song, uh, Break On Through? Have you got the words for that? This is the, another song by uh, The Doors. You know the day destroys the night, night divides the day. Try to run, try to hide. Break on to the other side. The thing about songs is a lot of truth is hidden in songs because, um, you know, for the most part, we had to block out uh, of our mind um, truth because it, it was just about our lost state of innocence and, and all that, because it was just unbearable. And, and to talk about um, um, that was, but nevertheless, um, there does exist in us this fabulous, exciting hope and dream that one day we would free ourselves from the human condition. So, um, and, and every now and again, that deeper truth, even though for the most part we didn't want to look at it, because if we, to look about this magic true world and have to live in this, um, this present uh, uh, dark and, and, and hidden in this horrible cave of denial would be just make, make the truth about this magic true world and the potential future just unbearable. So we just didn't want to admit that. But nevertheless, the, the truth could bubble up in songs. I mean, poetry and song were marvellous vehicles for allowing uh, this bubbling up to occur, some truth to be broken out, to, to, to let rhyme express thoughts that, and emotions that otherwise we wouldn't be able to express. So in, in the words of so songs, you can in poetry, you, a lot of truth slips through our guard. So, we, so what's he said here? You know, the day destroys the night. Well, the night is obviously living in this cave of dark denial, unable to confront the issue of the human condition. So the day is sun, the truth. Night divides the day. So night's blocking us our way from the, in, in Plato's analogy. Night is stopping the darkness. is stopping us looking to the day. It's stopping us confront the sun. And it says he tried to run, tried to hide. So we used all these escapist ways to live our life. We were evasive. We were... Um, trying to get a win out of all sorts of adventures and, and escapisms, and we tried to hide from the truth by pretending it didn't. We we denied it, um, and so we dreamed of this break on through. But one day we got a break on through to the other side. Other side of what? Of this dark, horrible state we've had to live on. So this is a dream of. I mean, someone once asked, once asked me, you know, what do you think, Jim Morrison? You know, he's seen such a tragedy to, to, to almost like suicide. He just self-destroyed with drugs and stuff and 
But that's the thing about Jim Morrison. He was such a heroic person. He he basically decided, look, I don't want to live in this bloody cave, in effect. You know, I if I can't get out in the sun, if I can't break on through to the other side, I don't want any part of this anymore. So he just sort of self-destroyed. He's incredibly honest. And um, so, yeah, you can see in, in Break On Through that there's, there's the whole parable of the story of the human condition there in in uh, in, in in the words. Um, I mean, there's lots of other songs that go on and on. Um, I might rip through some just for your interest, um, just to show you how powerful um, some how powerful truth comes through in songs. Uh, this is Bono's words from U2 song where the streets have no name. I want to tear down the walls that hold us inside. So that's the cave again. I want to reach out and touch the flame, the truth, which has been horribly confronting, where the streets have no name. I want to go to this place where no, there's no longer any egocentricity, where the streets don't have any name. I want to feel the sunlight on my, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I want to feel the sunlight on my face. There's the sun again. See that dust cloud disappear without a trace. I want to see the end of the human condition. And from love, rescue me. I mean, what, love, truth, rescue me. Love is truth, ultimately. The ultimate form of love or uh, as compassion is, is, is truth about ourselves. So love, truth, rescue me. Raise me up. My own hands imprison me. My own actions have been led to me being a horribly angry, egocentric, and alienated human. And the sun in the sky makes a shadow of you and I. It exposes us. I'm here without a name. I'm alienated. In the palace of my shame. And then he goes on and then has a funny little thing he adds at the end, which is sort of a little th- where he, he dreams of when we're free of the human condition and he says, I've conquered my past, found understanding of the human condition. The future is here at last. I stand at the entrance to a new world I can see. The ruins to the right of me will soon have lost sight of me. Love, rescue me. He's pleading for the truth to turn up on this godforsaken planet and save us from ourselves. Because if you think about that Adam Stork story, I mean, the more he searches for knowledge, the price of searching for knowledge, he becomes angry, egocentric, and alienated. So the longer that search goes on without him finding that knowledge, the more angry, egocentric, and alienated he becomes until he becomes fearfully, horrifically angry, egocentric, and alienated. And that's where the human race is right now. In fact, right living on the threshold of terminal alienation, self-destruction. So um, um, love, rescue me. Yeah. Um, the rock musical Hair, you know, contained uh, from the 60s, contained the song that pleaded to let the sun shine in. Um, um, and the song Aquarius, uh, which similarly came from that musical, um, anticipated the time of harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abound. No more falsehoods and derisions, all the dishonesty from the sort of Bullshit we talk about and all excuses we use inside the cave because we can't face the truth, no longer necessary. Um, no more falsehoods or derisions. Golden living dreams of visions and the mind's true liberation. The mind's true liberation. How more, more clear a description of our freedom from the human condition than that? We dance until the dawn of day. There's the sun again. And those people at the bottom of the picture dancing until the dawn of day that sort of now arrived. Um the words of uh, Walter Brown's song, If I Can Dream, that Elvis Presley sang, there must be peace and understanding sometimes, strong winds of promise that will blow away all the doubt and fear. If I can dream of a warmer sun, there's the sun again, where, the, where hope keeps shining on everyone. We're trapped in a world that's troubled with pain. Still I am sure that the answer's going to come somehow. Out there in the dark, there's a beckoning candle out there in the dark. He's living for hope that one day. So this guy who wrote that, Walter Brown, you can actually read the description when he wrote it. He said, I just was commissioned to write this story for Elvis, this song for Elvis, and I couldn't, it wouldn't come. And then in the middle of the night, I had this sort of absolute epiphany and, and, and suddenly connected to all this stuff and it just came pouring out. It's just so truthful description of this, this time when finally we break through into the clear. Um, Cat Stevens, or Yusuf Islam, as he's now called, song, Peace Trade. I've been smiling lately, dreaming about the world as one, when it all reconciled, and believe someday it's going to come, because out on the edge of darkness there rides a peace train. I mean, that's almost the same as what Earl Brown said, out there in the, in the dark there is beckoning candle. 
So uh, Cat Stevens said, out, cause out on the edge of darkness, there rides a peace train. Oh, peace train, take me home again. Everyone jump upon the peace train and come and join the living. End this cave existence. Take us home again. Home from, because before we became sufferers, became conscious, we were living in this cooperative loving state, as I explained in my book. And then the shit hit the fan. We, we became sufferers, horrific sufferers of the human condition. So there's this dream of take me home again. Um, and in Changes 4, Cat Stevens, don't you feel the changes coming, breaking down the walls of silence, all the dishonesty, lifting shadows from your mind, making sense of everything at last. Yesterday has passed. Now let's all start living for the one that's going to last because this reconciling understanding puts an end to it forever, all that upset. Because that's what it is. I call it upset. This Adam Stork becomes angry, eccentric, and alienated, which is upset. We used to call it corrupted or evil. They're all negative connotations. It's, it is a state of psychological upset, but it's not a bad state. It's a massively heroic state. Remember, Adam Stork and Adam and Eve Stork are the heroes of the story of life on earth. That's how wonderful we really are. Um, um, yesterday has passed. Now let's all start living the one that's going to last. The day is coming. When your children see the answers, the explanation, when the clouds have all gone and the beauty of all things is uncovered again, same as um, 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 the doors and um, uh, uncovered again. Don't you feel the day is coming when the people of all the world can live in one room together? And we shake off the ancient chains of our tomb, chains of our tomb. That's the cave analogy again. Bob Dylan, when the ship comes in, and the, his song, the hour that the ship comes in, what ship? Ship of understanding. And the morning will be a breaking, there's the sun. And the words that are used to get the ship confused, that means all the false, dishonest excuses we've used, will no longer be understood as they're spoken, not be understood as being the truth. For the chains holding us back of the sea will have busted in the night, and like Goliath, they'll be they'll be conquered. All the dishonesty will be conquered by this understanding that obsoletes the need to live in all this dishonest denial. And um, Bob Dylan's from the times they are changing. The present now will later be past for the times they are changing. And John Fogarty from Credence, Credence Clearwater of Revival song, Who Will Stop the Rain? Long as I remember, the rain's been coming down. Long as I remember, the rain's full of horror. Clouds of mystery pouring confusion on the ground. Good men through the ages trying to find the sun. There's the sun again, understanding. And I wonder still, I wonder who'll stop the rain. There's this great hunger in the human heart that one day we would find this reconciling understanding. So that's what I'm suggesting this book presents, that two million year search for dignifying, relieving, psychologically healing understanding of us, of why we're good and not bad or after all. The composer, Andrew Lloyd Webber, he wrote a requiem, inspired, he said, by the story of a Cambodian boy who had been forced to by the soldiers of Pol Pot to kill his sister. But how could such horror inspire such beautiful music? I mean, surely it's because there is this greater truth that's, that stands above all the horror and suffering on this planet. Um, and that is, that despite our capacity for evil, humans are still sublimely beautiful beings. Despite our capacity for evil, we are still good. And, and, and so that's how he could write a requiem inspired by that horror. Because we lived in hope and faith and trust that one day, from somewhere probably, as Professor Prosen says in his introduction, some secluded corner of the world, these answers might emerge because they're not going to come out of the ivory towers of academia, as Professor Rosen says, Harry says, because, I mean, that's, that, that, that academia was built inside the cave. It's all run by, I mean, scientists are humans suffering from the human condition. So they're all living in mortal fear of the subject of the human condition. So they invented all these excuses, cave excuses. For why we are the way we are, they're all dishonest. And chapter two of my book goes through and dismantles all the dishonest biological excuses and, and explains and reveals their hidden agenda that the underlying issue, strategy is to try to find a way to 
to deny the human condition, to not have to face it. And, and so, yeah, we built this, um, this castle of lies inside this cave and this book finally demolishes it. So this has um, 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 as, um, Alvin Toffler, who wrote Future Shock, said in, in Future Shock, he described this as future shock, the shattering stress and disorientation we induce in individuals by subjecting them to too much change in too short a time. So this is the ultimate future shock. Suddenly we've been living in a cave of denial and we turn the lights on. When the, when the blinds are drawn on the human condition, um, uh, on, on, on our human situation, all manner of sort of previously unconfrontable and thus denied truths suddenly become revealed. So this is a massive amount of exposure. There's a, this book is a veritable litany of, of, um, of heresies, such as that, that God can be demystified as the physical law of negative entropy, that uh, that human condition of any mechanistic science is leading humanity to oblivion, that the left wing in politics is dangerously artificial, that there's been a difference in the roles between men and women of our species, horrific journey to enlightenment, that there are differences in alienation between races. Uh, so, yeah, the, these insights are potentially extremely controversial, even in seniory. But such is what happens when you draw the blinds on the human condition, all the dishonesty that we've been practising and perfecting and mastering. We're, inside that cave, we built this absolutely beautifully structured little castle of lies and everyone was party to it and no one could break could, could expose it because any bit of light crept in, we'd go and block it out. So it's a beautifully structured and all. Everyone's running around there comfortable in that. But one day that all had to be, was going to be demolished. So this is sort of truth day, honesty day, exposure day, judgment day, you know, although judgment is always, it's not a time of, of, of condemnation, but of, of, of relieving understanding. Nevertheless, it's, it's, it's a massive shock that these understandings unavoidably bring. So this is the biggest paradigm shift human race has ever had to face. It's a massive shock because it all happens so suddenly. One day we're living in the cave of denial, we're swanning around in there thinking that there's no other world and suddenly it's all exposed and a whole new world is introduced. I mean, this book doesn't, it's not like um, introducing, people back themselves in reading a book that, you know, they understand the paradigm they're in. So if it's a, like if you use the analogy of, of a motor car, if you had... Um, someone invents a new spark plug or something and they, and they write a book about it. And people reading that can, can factor in pretty quickly where it's coming from. Okay, it's a new spark plug and understand it. But this is not, this is we're wheeling in a whole new machine we've never seen before. So, so you can't, you start reading this book, as Professor Proson says in his introduction, you go deeper into shock. Because you, you, you just can't believe that you're ever going to read a book that actually gets in behind what the human condition really is and makes sense of it all. So you, you, you start a reading and you think, oh, yeah, it'll be another, it might have a nice little angle on this, a nice little angle on that. But the possibility that someone's actually got in behind the human condition and from there explained and exposed everything, everything at last is beyond, it's almost beyond our, our wildest dreams. But that's actually what's happened. And, and, and thank goodness it has at the nick of time because, as I said, you know, the ra human race is heading flat chat to towards terminal alienation with all these floods of immigrants and migrations and, and um, the suffering in the world is, is astronomical. And, and the only thing that could stop it is this deeper understanding of why we are the way we are. Only that can bring this relieving understanding to ourselves, finally bring p healing peace to the human condition.